Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is the Go Bolt story with my friend Mark Ang. How's it going, Mark? It's going well, Joe. Thanks for having me. Mark, please introduce yourself and your company where you're calling from today. Yeah, so I'm Mark. I'm one of our founders and our CEO calling in from Toronto, Canada. The company, Go Bolts, has an interesting origin story, which didn't start off doing logistics, but today we're a 3PL partner that acts more as an extension of our merchants' teams, doing everything from storage across our 15 sites and counting, pick, pack, shipping, last mile delivery for big and bulky product, but also last mile delivery for small parcels. So spanning the gamut and doing everything first party, which has been really fun. Mark, I think what's really interesting about what you guys are doing, and it's very necessary, is you, you're you based in Canada, but you have operations here in the U.S. Because what somebody said not so long ago on my podcast is when somebody goes on the internet, it doesn't tell you whether you're getting Canada internet or US internet, it's the internet, right? And so sure. when somebody says, I want to buy this, and they happen to be in Windsor or Vancouver, or, you know, in for your case, or in Detroit, where I'm at, we want it. And and I think a lot of companies struggle to, they end up hiring multiple co- uh, companies, one for the US, one for Canada. Not ideal. And you have different systems at that point. Well, it becomes, yeah, the more partners that you have to manage, the more overhead that you have to take on as a brand to manage all those partners to make sure everything's working in unison. So we try to, you know, pare down the partners that our merchants have to work with and be one back to pat for them across the board. And it's been working well so far. So we think that we're we're hopefully onto something. I saw today, I was just before we hit record, uh, I was looking at your website and it, it said, one back to pat. And I was like, as opposed to the one throat to choke. And that was what I was going to get to is I would don't want to have to wonder like, who, who screwed that up? It was, oh, it was the guys on the, you know, in Canada versus the guys in Mexico. And there's a cost to having to manage and then having multiple systems. Not good. Yeah. it's uh, So I'm, I'm going to have to keep it completely honest. We used to say one throat to choke internally. One of our merchants, one of our first merchants in the US <laughs> actually said, Mark, like, one throat to choke is so negative. What you're actually providing is one back to Pat. So maybe think of changing it that way. And right. the moment she told me that, I've, we've never gone back. And it's it's now on the website, as you, as you pointed out. So that had a big impact. So, Mark, before we talk more about your company, Go Bolt, and by the way, that is spelled G-O, as in Go, and then Bolt, B-O-L-T. So we'll get back to your name in a second. But tell us a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? Where'd you go to school? And give us some career highlights before you and your partner. You have one partner? Yeah, I have one, uh, one co-founder, Hendrick. Okay, so a little bit about you before you started uh, the Mighty Go Bolt. Yeah, so it's interesting. I, I have a, a pretty varied past, but it starts when I was younger. My, my dad got me involved in his business early, uh, early days, which was real estate development. But he was a big believer that you start from the ground up. And so I was literally digging trenches to put electrical <laughs> conduit down uh, in a backyard of a house that we were building. Um, I was pulling wire, I was framing and just doing regular labor work uh, around the, the job site. And so did that for a number of summers throughout high school. Always had a bit of an entrepreneurial bug, always was toying around with ideas. Started a small import export business for auto parts. My friends made fun of me because I was importing brake pads and undercutting you know, businesses that would do the same thing. I just had no overhead, so I was able to do that. And they said, hey, Mark, it's a really unsexy business. So then I pivoted and I designed and manufactured uh, a small like micro brand watch company. Just kickstarted a couple of those uh, models and sold that through Shopify. That was actually my first brush with using a 3PL, which we should maybe come back to because that, that left an impression on me. I was going to say, as soon as you said import, export, a lot of people who seem to get into this fulfillment piece were e-commerce sellers and they struggled. Yeah. I think, you know, you can always empathize with like a fellow DTC founder or someone that's selling products. And I think good entrepreneurs usually fall in love with, you know, a solution. I think great entrepreneurs fall in love with a problem and logistics just has so many problems to fall in love with and, and figure out solutions to. 
And so, you know, fast forward a little bit, went to the University of Toronto. I studied commerce. My co-founder, Heinrich, studied engineering. The way engineering works is you, you take a PEY year. So he's a year older or a couple years older than me, but was working at BMW, developing their connected drive system. We linked up through a friend. Long story short, I was supposed to start in management consulting full-time. Heinrich was supposed to start as a product manager at a health tech company. And we decided to launch this consumer storage company for a lot of our international student friends where we'd store their boxes and their personal belongings over the summer. That's a big biz. So I'm, I live right near Ann Arbor where University of Michigan is. And from what I understand, all the international students, when they leave for the summer, they, they have to store their stuff. Is that the kind of biz? Exactly. Exactly. And, and honestly, it's actually unfortunate. Joe. A lot of our friends are being gouged. Like you would store a box for 90 bucks, which oh, yeah. is, it's outrageous. <laughs> so we were comparatively around 24 and we'd pick up for free. We'd return it to you. And so it was a great, it was like a great value prop. Now with 500 bucks, we, you know, basically had built a website. We, you know, had a bunch of Vista print postcards and we broke into dorm residences and started sliding these under dorm room doors. <laughs> we put posters up in front of urinals and inside of stalls where we knew we'd have a captive audience. And we, we it, it kind of- That's guerrilla marketing solid. right there. Yeah, it's, a little, it's the right dose of illicit activity to just get the right amount of lift. And so we, we did that for a couple of weeks and it, it garnered around 20K of monthly recurring revenue in those wow. few weeks. So it's funny because we had a 3PL partner to support the pickups and drop-offs as a file storage company, believe it or not. And on our day of our last exam, April 28th of 2017, the president of that company called me up at 9.37 and said, Mark, our guys are burnt out. You've grown way too fast. They're refusing to do your jobs today. And so unfortunately, you're on your own. And I stood there. I'm like, what? Holy shit. Like we, we're, we're basically, you know, we're screwed. And uh, doubly so because Heinrich was in an exam from nine to 11 and I was going into an exam from 11 to, to one. And so when Heinrich came out of his exam, he thought he was going to be washing his undergrad engineering career down with a beer. Instead, we put him in an Uber to go get the, the only U-Haul available in the city, which was an hour away. I wrote my exam in 10 minutes, managed to get out and then meet up with Heinrich. And we just did our pickups until 4 a.m. And again, for the next two days. And <laughs> the reason I tell that story is... Though that business is not one that we do today, we, we're you know no longer doing consumer storage. We're firmly doing logistics and e-commerce fulfillment. It really like left a call it PTSD with us that everything that we would have to do would have to be first party if we were going to create pretty like audacious commitments to our merchants and their shoppers and consistently live up to them. And that's why today we have this like ferocious goal and and a requirement to first party all critical aspects of our business. And we managed to do that today. That's why our team is a little bit larger th than normal is because we've got all of our, our great associates on the on the road and, and in our warehouses uh, that make up part of our, our headcount team. So we then, uh, you know, later down the road started getting hacked by companies to store their merchandise and store their uh, retail displays and move them around the city just because it was a reliable service. It was tech enabled and it was easy. And so we started developing custom software and then we went down the slippery slope of, of logistics and, and now offer it on a full-fledged basis. Yeah, you mentioned wanting that control. And before we hit record, you said you guys have your own software. A lot of companies in your biz would say, we'll just get a third party. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with it. I talked to third-party logistics providers, software providers who are great. No issue. Just did a webinar with Softion. Wonderful. But it's more control. And then as you open up your locations here in the U.S., I take it those are not partners. Those are your locations. Yeah, every single site, every single truck. See, there's a, there's a lot of companies, and we just talked about them before we hit record, are growing kind of with a broker model. Is I'm going to I'm going to vet a whole bunch of warehouses, and they're all going to use my software. And I'm sure they have pretty good control, but not as good as if you own the building and then people are your employees and the software they're using is your software. Yeah, I think you can just really rally the team around a level of customer obsession that just wouldn't exist when it's two or three degrees separated, Joe. And I think that's what we're trying to show up. And certainly you can get a good service with a broker model, but we really want to deliver like an exceptional one. And I think it necessitates having software that's flexible, an operation that can be flexible at scale. And, and that's what we've really endeavored to create. That's fantastic. Um, so you mentioned you, you're in this kind of consumer business for students. And by the way, I, I live near two big universities, Michigan State and University of Michigan. This is so, so crazy. Uh, friends of mine have been talking about how 
foreign students, I think a lot of them from China, leave their cars in the airport and walk away. Done. And these are not just any cars. They're Land Rovers <laughs> walking away. Me and my friends were like, hey, could you leave the keys in that? I'll, <laughs> I'll give you I'll 50 bucks for it. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. But anyway, you switched out of the consumer. And so when did the the business officially get started in the current incarnation? So the business has been around just over five years, Joe. And the B2B division has really been in its current form around for just over three years. And so in that time, we basically built off of an existing operation stack, which keep in mind, like we had already scaled to four cities for the consumer division. And when we started to re-architect it for B2B okay. logistics... We already had a certain level of presence, operational depth, and, and acumen that was able to, to just turn on much faster. So the pivot was actually much more natural and, and more seamless than probably it sounds because it was really a software front-end change for our, our merchants versus anything else in the back end. That, that's fantastic. So you mentioned 15 locations. Can you name them off at the top of your head? Yeah. And we have multiple sites in, in particular cities. So it's, it's really 12, 12 cities. So yeah. Toronto... Ottawa, Montreal, Vancouver, Calgary, and Canada. So you got Canada. Wait, so you have East Coast too? So you have 100% of Canada covered. Pretty much, yeah. We, there are most East Coast locations, Montreal, which sort of covers any kind of maritime uh, provinces. But yeah, we've got Canada and like the five biggest cities covered. Yeah, that's not easy in Canada. <laughs> you guys got some space to cover. And you've got it's, that. Uh, it's not always densely populated either. No, we're very thin. I mean, uh, in grade five geography, we'd consistently be reminded, and I'm going to fail my, my grade five teacher now, Ms. Uh, Granger, but I think either within 600 or 1,000 kilometers, we have most of the population from the U.S. border, right? So it's, it's extremely thinly spread across a very large landmass. So that's in Canada. On the U.S. side, we have New York, Miami, Houston, L.A. live. We have Dallas, Austin, and Atlanta coming up in the next couple of months. Wow, that is a footprint. You mentioned uh, your Mont- you serve uh, the Maritimes from Montreal. Maritimes being Nova Scotia, PY, Halifax. Uh, yeah, that, so P- yeah. Territory. One time I drove to Halifax from Detroit. I would not recommend it. It's too far. But my old roommate who lives in Halifax said, make sure you get gas every time you see a gas station after you leave Montreal. Montreal is like eight hours from Detroit. <laughs> yeah. I almost ran out of gas. I, I could not believe how th- how empty that space could be. So it, it's it's crazy how much space Canada has. But again, if you're saying same day, next day, you've got to support that. And so you've got to support brands who have a really high bar. It's hard, hard enough here in the U.S. doing it. We got some we got some spread out areas here too. Yeah, it, you know the nice thing with the U.S. is there's more of a network of kind of highways and roads that connect cities. In Canada, you really have like the Trans-Canada Highway that just connects end to end, and that's pretty much it. 401. Get on 401. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And so I I think, you know, you mentioned the gas problem. As we work to electrify 100% of our fleet, which is one of our kind of, you know, audacious kind of goals that we've got, we need to be considerate of that as well, right? So where should we centering our locations? What range can they support? What volume would they be able to serve? All part of like our kind of hub and spoke model as we think about new cities to develop and new cities to launch in. And that's a really important consideration too. Right. So you mentioned your dad was in the land development biz building. Is that, is that a helpful, is that a helpful background? Because like, man, you guys acquired a lot of land quick, or a lot of locations quickly. Yeah. So, you know, for, for a number of reasons, I actually haven't stayed in touch with my dad going back, you know, to when I was 17, my brother and I actually moved out and have been like we're completely on our own from that point forward. Wow. <laughs> but the experience around managing like trades, you know, on the construction side, real estate agents, architects, lawyers, et cetera, just gave me really awesome exposure that I, you know, it, it's invaluable, right? It, it compounds from an earlier age and that just continues to hopefully serve you well as you continue to grow. And I was lucky to have started with that much earlier than I probably otherwise would have. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, who you serve. So who are your customers and what are the problems that you're solving for them? Yeah. So our our, our customers today are mid-market and enterprise, you know, re- traditional retail or digitally native businesses or, you know, folks that are converging on a hybrid of those two that need either, and this is not, they, they can kind of take a medley of services, but warehousing, fulfillment, or la- last mile and reverse logistics support. So we kind of bucket them into fulfilled by go bolt and fulfilled by merchant categories. So fulfilled by go bolt are folks that store with us, use our distributed warehouse network to intelligently order orchestrate inventory and orders, 
And then we pick, pack, and ship the product out from those markets. And then fulfilled by merchant is when we pick up with our trunk line trucks and we line haul them back to our facilities, sort them, and then inject them into our parcel network. So we work with both types of those merchants and we are size agnostic. So we've got a very strong white glove, big and bulky home delivery team. And then we also have uh, a parcel delivery and last mile team that, that does the final mile to the door for, for small packets. So when you say parcel, that's not um, Pure Later or FedEx or UPS. That's, uh, oh, it is? Okay. No, it is. Yeah, that, that's it. That's exactly it. So we're a fully electric alternative to, to those options where you know we work in combination with them. So because we have a fully electric EV fleet on the parcel side, we can only go so far. You can't, you don't have the luxury of filling up at the next gas station. You've got to charge up and then make your route and come back. So outside of, let's say, you know, 150 miles from our hub, we need to use a partner to affect that parcel delivery. So we'll always have relationships with carriers, but we'll provide a, a same day, next day, fully electric option in our markets with our own fleet. So, so you're working with retailers, traditional retailers who uh, want to start selling online. Now, do you guys deliver food? I know that uh, is a kind of a separate category. Yeah. So we don't store food product, but we do last mile parcel meal kit boxes, food products, um, et cetera. Anything that has um, stability to move through like a carrier network, usually they're dry ice boxes and they've got a 24 right, hour right, shot right. clock to get to the door. So it's like local to local executions. But yeah, we also support that, Joe. We're not as opinionated on the parcel side because you're picking up, sorting, and then delivering. Well, I think what you described is kind of what we all are moving towards is, you know, it's funny, we've done something with final mile delivery providers. So when you think about like here in the US, we have UPS and FedEx, those are traditionally who would deliver, but they're not going to deliver same day, next day necessarily, right? Then we think of all these gig economy companies that came in great, but, um, and then there's uh, logistics companies that are waiting in. And what I really think is required is a logistics company with the technology and operational know-how and expertise, best practice and say, we'll use all these options. We'll just make sure it happens. And so, and as to your point also here, that one back to Pat, right? You guys will manage it. You say, I don't care. We'll get it there. This is all about partnering. And, but I do think that final mile is still a little bit of the wild west. And that's why you need logistics guys. And that, you know, that I'll just call it the grind. I mean, what were you, what we're used to doing certain things and it's grinding out costs and grinding out time. <laughs> and that's exactly it, right? When we, provide a more integrated solution from warehousing, pick and pack to delivery, whether it's a big or small product, there's more scale and kind of share of the logistics wallet that we can help optimize. So if you're a large Fortune 100 apparel company that, that comes to us and we figure out these are the two or three warehouses that make sense to store at, we can then design the network to best serve your, your you know, financial goals too by using a combination of our electric fleet and our carrier partners and making sure that we're in proximity to where your, your hot zones are. So a lot of really interesting things you can do when you've got certain coverage areas and certain capabilities. So I want to ask you a question and we'll make, I'll make myself the customer. So let's just say I have a sock company and I am e-commerce mostly. Um, and maybe I'm selling in some local stores, but we won't worry about that. And I say, I need your help. Help me expand not only in the Detroit area where I'm at, not just in Michigan, uh, not just the Midwest, but all over Canada and the U.S. How would you know where my inventory goes? I mean, what I is it kind of from based on the orders? How does this work? Yeah. So let's take a world where you have only one SKU and just keep it super simple for us to start, and then we can talk about a world where we have. Oh, that, that that I'll start screwing us over with multiple SKUs. <laughs> yeah. When you want to offer a selection to the market, that becomes a problem. No, it's, it's, they both need to become, but if there's one skew, what we would likely suggest is look, we look at the data first and say, okay, do you have an opinionated client base? I.e., are they on a particular coast? Are they central? Are they on two coasts? And, and then design and, you know, pull from our network of almost 17 sites now and say, where should we place you? Oftentimes for apparel companies, depending on where you're being manufactured, it makes sense to store within Canada and directly inject, which we do first party, into the U.S. Uh, under Section 321. And there's a duty arbitrage that you can take advantage of where it saves you on the inbound and then basically could just kind of pass through Canada. 
What is Section 321? So Section 321 is a section that's within the kind of U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. It used to be under NAFTA, and it got brought into... That's NAFTA 2.0, which is... So that's U.S.M.C.? A, yeah, exactly. We got put last because I think we had our our prime minister and the president at the time had a bit of strife, and so Mexico (laughs) before Canada. I think U.S. CA makes sense just from a perspective you can say it. <laughs> Fair enough. There, there was a bit more color behind the scenes, Joe, but I think, yeah, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement is also. Well, the good news is, however they did it, we had a problem with e-commerce under NAFTA. So this hopefully improved it. Am I right to say that? Well, this existed before that, Joe. So this is actually one of the things that maintain, and it maintained for this reason. But basically what Section 321 says is that, you know, you can you have goods come through Canada, and you know you pay duties on the way in, but then if the duties are ultimately going to go into the U.S. under a certain order dollar threshold, which is 800 U.S. going from Canada to the U.S., you can then draw back the duty that you paid coming into Canada, right. because the whole idea was that the goods were never meant to stay in Canada; they were just passing through Canada. Yeah, it's kind of a transshipment thing. You, you got it. So it helps apparel companies in particular. So your sock company, in this example save, uh, if you're shipping high volumes, it could sh- save you literally hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in, in taxes. Completely above board, completely legal, but it's a complex system that we need to make sure that we... And I have to pay that first and then submit the form to get the money back. Yeah, you got it. There, there's certain things that as you get bigger, you can take advantage of, but for all intents and purposes, like that's the most uh, common approach. So anyways, you've got your stock company. We determine which coast that you're going to be on or both. And then we can order orchestrate across those two sites, take the one that's going to be closest, drive the fastest shipping time and the lowest shipping cost, and then fulfill. And if you're on Shopify, we connect within two seconds. If you're on another system, we likely can connect with it quickly as well. So do you guys kind of, you'll advise me on where I need to have inventory? Because what I don't want is I don't want to make a whole bunch of my socks, put them somewhere. I'm not going to put them in all the 17 locations you have because I'm not necessarily selling to all those like locations, but I hope to, but I also hope never to get to the place where I have a whole bunch of money tied up in inventory. And will you, you I mean, it. do you guys, do you guys consult your clients like me and help me grow my business? Because I'm not, I'm a, I'm a sock expert. Come on. You got, you guys are the experts. Can you guide me on how to grow this biz? And again, inventory is a big problem. It, well, it's a huge it's a huge cash hog, and you need to deploy it first before you see anything back. And it's a bit of a shot in the dark until you have more traction and data. So we use a lot of our upfront getting to know each other process to fact find and solution find. It's not really selling you on something. It's more so seeking to understand what you need and what we can potentially offer. And it's a lot more consultative than like, hey, like I want a car, sell me a car. It's, okay, what are the things that you're trying to achieve? Where's your customer base? What's your SKU profile? We want to make sure that if we do use multiple sites, your attach rate as as close to 100% as possible so you're not splitting shipments. And once we kind of determine all that, we'll put a business case forward to you and say, this is what it would look like. Then when, you know, and if you start with us, it becomes part of our account management rhythms to track and maintain those targets. Right. And I think the real problem, I mentioned something probably fairly easy. I got one SKU. The problem becomes when I have 50 SKUs and the top 10 sell 80% and the other 40 are <laughs> making up that last 20%. <laughs> the other problem there too, Joe, is that what if the top 10 always attach to one of the bottom you know, 90 uh, or 40 SKUs in this case, right? So w- when we analyze the data, it's, okay, yes, we should move your top movers closer to these areas. But we should also move this many SKUs there as well because they often sell with the top sellers. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. And this is I think this is one of the challenges that comes with if I'm an e-commerce company, I'm probably really good at the web internet, right? I, I know how to drive people to a site and I'm good at making socks. And maybe that's where my team of uh, skill set gets weak after that after it's gone to the into the basket for I'm to be bought that's when I start holding my breath so I can partner with you and you can say Joe this is how we're going to set you up and I can grow with you uh, that see this is what I think is so critical these days is I can't I think 50% of warehouses in the US and I'm assuming it's pretty close in the US 50% of warehouses in the US 
have one warehousing business, have one location. So if I say I just hired a 3PL and they are sensational and they're in Utah or Indiana or California, I mean, there's going to be somebody who's not going to get next day service. It's exactly. And and that's where we see a lot of those like really awesome one-to-one owner operator relationships deteriorate, right? Is where you now need multiple, you need a, a larger conglomerate. And so what we've tried to do, Joe, is create that boutique experience where you've got a dedicated person to call, text, email seven days a week. You've got a team of support people that wrap around that. So we've done a lot of interesting things, we think, on the back end to still give you that feel, but the scale that your business might need as it grows. So yeah, we, we try to think through it, like I said, as, as operational partners, not as a third-party logistics provider. Right. Now, do you guys get into fencing or is that fencing some of the product? I know I don't even know if we call it the same thing, but where... Let's just say I'm selling I'm selling on Amazon Marketplace, but I'm also selling it on my website, and I'm also selling it maybe some other e-commerce sites. And I can't ever have all my socks kind of being. Let's just say Amazon had Prime Day, and all of a sudden all the socks are gone, so you can't buy them on e-commerce or on my website. Sure. Yeah, we we call that like safety stock or stock allocation. So our team is actually imminently in a sprint that is making some enhancements to that for more channels. Like typically what we see is like wholesale direct to consumer and partner uh, channels. So we had wholesale and e-com, but we're adding on channel allocation of stock. So it's getting more and more robust, but that's based on feedback from our merchant base. Yeah, that's, 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 there's some real challenges. And one of the things I've learned from talking to people like you over time is a lot of brands find out that not all their SKUs are profitable and maybe they're profitable because they said they sold them. But by the time they add in storage costs and then transportation costs, they find out that, Hey, these bottom SKUs aren't helping me. And somebody was on my podcast and he said that he was advising a large retailer and and the, the vice president of merchandise came into a meeting and said, no more magenta sweaters for women. No more. We've ne- and it, and they went back and they, and they had actually done the accounting after the fact. What the transportation cost, what the storage cost was, inventory carrying costs, and said we've never made a nickel on a magenta <laughs> magenta women's sweater, and yet they were selling them. And that's the that's one of the challenges you have once you put it into a into a system like yours, which is obviously critical. I don't know what the final costs are until I actually sell the darn thing. And is you guys can give me the information, but you can't sell it for me. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. We can only retroactively go through that with you. And I think storage is not a value added line item. We we tell this to pretty much all of our merchants. We want to see that line item be as small as possible because it's a dormant arbitrage on of large costs that we've taken on on a long term basis and are giving to partners on a short term basis. And the quick, the quicker we can turn that around, the better it is for, for our merchant, their shopper, and for us. And so, yeah, we're really aligned to not have that be the case. And we try to find opportunities. Oftentimes, you know, it's making recommendations like that. Your magenta sweater, sorry, we need more blue sweaters. Let's move in that direction. And um, sometimes it's helpful to have an external partner point that out because it's not always top of mind when you're in it every day. Right. And, you know, by the way, I think also this is one some of the stuff I've learned along the way is... Amazon has made it clear to a lot of the people who used to sell on their on Amazon that you are not a good fit anymore. And part of it was you're asking us to store stuff. Stuff isn't moving fast enough. And other brands said, I'm unhappy that I don't get to own the experience. Amazon owns the experience. So I want to move. And, and I imagine they're moving to companies like yours where they can own the experience. And I think Nike's like that. I think Allbirds is like that. And I'm sure there's going to be many others. Nothing against Amazon. Obviously, they're a juggernaut. They set the standard for us, but that doesn't mean they're perfect for everybody. But there's all those of those smaller sellers who probably had very good businesses. And now all of a sudden, Amazon's saying, you're not quite the right profile anymore. So are you guys getting it, working with some of those kind of companies? Yeah. A lot of our merchants today, Joe, like you know, forward place product to Amazon locations ad hoc. So they'll have their primary stock with us. We might do some FBM for them in some markets and in other areas. We What is FBM? Fulfilled by merchant. So on it, there's FBA, so fulfilled by Amazon and FBM yep. where it's fulfilled by merchant. And in this case, we are receiving the orders from their marketplace and then executing them for them. Oh, that's excellent. 
Yeah. So they can still get like our electric fleet. They can still get our order orchestration capabilities, but it's selling through that channel. They get that same experience that they're used to, whether it's fulfilled by Amazon or fulfilled by the merchant. And let's face it, the merchant can't fulfill it um, in most cases without you. Now, does is FB is fulfillment by Amazon? Do they have that also in Canada? Yeah, you got it. They, they have, I think, across most of their active markets right now. Excellent, excellent. So, I want to switch gears for a minute, if you don't mind, Mark. So, you guys have grown like a weed. <laughs> it sounds like you have very aggressive growth plans. Why is it? I mean, obviously, it's working. I mean, I mean, the average warehousing business has one location, and they've probably been around for twenty five years. You guys have been around shorter time. But you guys have almost seventeen locations soon. We'll be online. How did you? How did you? How did this happen? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it's been a very wild ride. I think you know the the crux of it, Joe, is that we have a couple different business lines that are service out of the same site. So we'll have our truck last mile division where we deliver big and bulky yep. products to customers' homes and varying levels of service. We've got storage and pick and pack, which operates out of the warehouse only. And then we have parcel last mile, which delivers, you know, some of those products to the home as well. And others we farm out to carriers within our network. So you've got three different revenue streams and three different um, opportunities that you can offer to merchants across the network. And I think what that's done and, and what we're seeing is that merchants just want a more unified logistics stack. There are thousands of single point solutions. It's a $1.4 trillion mess in North America. And I think what we're seeing is that just people want to simplify their life. They want to have fewer partners that are deeper, deep, more deeply entrenched um, that, you know, they can hold to a higher bar. And, you know, we feel like we do our best work when we're under pressure and logistics is a good place to stay under pressure. And it's, it's something that we've been able to continually rise to the occasion. So it's been working well. And I, it probably sounds cliche, but I'll say it just the same. You become an extension of your customer's supply chain. You're the, you're the, in your partner. And, and I, I say this all the time on my podcast, it's time to partner up. If you don't have technology and somebody else is developing it, <laughs> use yeah. theirs. If somebody's got a killer app, use theirs. Yeah. You guys have, I love the idea that you guys have kind of gone the other way in a lot of regards. I know you have partners, but you said we're going to control the stuff that ensures our success, our own locations, our own software, our, our own people, you know, that, but whatever you've done, it's, it's killing it. Well, I appreciate that, Joe. Yeah. I, I think, you know, we needed, and I think what we've just been doing and the team's done an incredible job is just listening to the merchant. So never, I guess, falling prey to whatever momentum that we may have. It's, you know, there's a level of customer obsession that exists within our company where it's whatever is best for the merchant must go. If it's easier on us, but it's harder on a merchant, that's, that's not going to be greenlit by, by the management team. It's generally got to be, let's take it on our chin and let's figure out how we can make it easier for ourselves later. But let's always like optimize towards um, simplifying our merchants' lives and, and start out for them in a positive way. So I'm just curious, you have locations all over North America now and so you've been a fast growing team. How do you keep that? Obviously, you, your locations in Toronto, how many locations do you have in Toronto? We've set up five. We've consolidated two of the smaller ones into the bigger ones uh, at this point. So we have three active. What Toronto is probably what, the second second or third largest city in the North America? For us, uh, ourselves, it's, it's, our, it's our largest. It's our largest site. Uh, yeah. But like from a population perspective, it's, yeah, it's, it's up there. I think it's probably New York and LA, Toronto, and Toronto. Mexico yeah. City. Yeah, if you could throw in Mexico down there. But yeah, Toronto is a huge spot. By the way, you guys never want to get yourself caught in Toronto rush hour. Oh my God. I, I remember kind of putzing around in Toronto thinking, I got time. I got time. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, there's a couple times of day that you need to avoid. And we have built a, a routing algorithm internally that solves for some of those problems because we don't want our parcel teams to get stuck in that right. either. So, yeah. I was advising someone on, on selecting a 3PL. This is uh, before I knew you guys. And it was going to be in GTA and greater Toronto area. And I said, I don't know if being on the outskirts is good from one regard, like you can get there. But if you have to go into the city every day, you might fight a lot of traffic back and forth. So where are your locations? Are they in the city or are they on the outskirts? You've This is probably critical to the where your locations, where is that traffic? Yeah. So we, we've got two of our big sites. Well, each of our sites in Toronto, like one's 100,000, one's 134,000, one's 300,000 square feet. So 
One of them's in Vaughan and it's got Highway 427 that can come south into the city. So that's a great kind of bus to, to move down. The other one's in, in Markham where we can come down the 404 and can get downtown quite quickly. You always hit the DVP though, which is a bit of a, a joke when it all collides. But once you get past that, you're, you're generally fine. What is DVP? It's the Don Valley Parkway. It's a uh, part parking lot, part highway. And so it uh, depends on time of day. <laughs> and then you've got, uh, we've got our YYZ4 location, which is um, really actually midtown. Like you can get downtown in 15 to 20 minutes. So that's the site where we kick off our last mile trucks from because it's just in such close, such close proximity to all of our the homes that we deliver into. So I know it gets cold in Toronto, like here in Michigan, but um, do you guys deliver all by vehicle or do you you have people on bikes too? It's interesting, right? We, we look at what are the, because we're moving fully electric with our fleet, like from a carbon neutrality perspective, I mean, whether you're pedaling and just exhaling CO2 or you're driving an electric truck, it's like they're fairly neutral. So we look at what's most economical and, and what's not going to create congestion. Our bike lanes are actually very congested for, for the city. So until those <laughs> become a bit wider, we don't think cargo bikes will get a better operational yield. We're going to still test them out. But right now, uh, I think our bets are on the, the EV parcel van still doing There's well. only a few places I would even ask about the cargo bikes. New York, I know, can get it done. But they have the same challenge as we do. They have winter. And uh, their bike lanes are probably jammed. Uh, Detroit is, maybe they can do it in Detroit, but again, the weather and uh, Detroit's also very spread out in some regards. But anyway, so you started in Toronto, but you opened up all these locations. Obviously, you're doing a good job or you wouldn't be able to continue to grow. How do you keep that culture that you developed with your tight little team there in Toronto in the beginning? Now, if you have all these locations in Toronto and now spreading out across North America, how do you keep everybody on the same page with that customer obsession and the right culture that allows you to keep satisfying customers and growing? Yeah. So I, I think, and I'm guilty of this because I, I didn't place the most amount of value on, on a vision and value set early days. And as we've grown and our, our business has expanded, I regret not doing it sooner. So we've just, I think, communicated a clear vision to the team and we've continuously hammered home like the importance of our value systems and tie back any major decision to our values. So it, it sounds kind of soft and fluffy, but when you create a culture where everything is evaluated through our value system, and you can say, does this meet X, Y, and Z? It lets you just move faster, and it decentralizes the vision and values that Heinrich and I have created um, as founders of the business and mobilizes the whole team and whole company to think about that. So... I think that's number one. And number two, Joe, I just think being very present. Like I still do ops days. I'm in the warehouses. I'm on the road. Uh, I'm speaking to the team very frequently. And I encourage the whole team to do that. We never want to be too dissonant from like the day-to-day the -day operations. It's, it is the lifeblood of the company and we got to stay close to it. Yeah. So, I mean, I know you have hundreds of employees now and it can't be, uh, you got to be hiring fast and, and, and keeping everybody on the same page is, uh, I imagine they got to see your face and hear it from you and hear it from your partner and hear it from the leadership of the company or they're not going to value it. Yeah. And, and by the way, I, you mentioned a few times your, your goals towards sustainability. I think communicating those, those values is going to be super important too, because I think more and more we, we know it, big brands, big companies and consumers are saying, I want sustainability and they're going to, they're going to go with companies that can provide that. And that doesn't happen overnight. No, I think you need to be willing to take risks. And I think, you know, as a startup scale up company, our risk tolerance is just much higher than a built up multi-billion dollar logistics business. And so in many ways, you know, we can marry our vision and values as a young company to what we can then affect on the sustainability side of, of being carbon negative by the end of next year. And so that's, that's fantastic. A big, it's a big push for us. So I know I'm going to lose you at the top of the hour. So I'm going to ask you, answer this in any, any order you want. So what's next for you? What's next for Go Bolt? And what's next for the industry that you, and I, I call that industry um, warehousing fulfillment, the e-commerce and retail stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, what's next for me and what's next for both, I think are, are generally one of the same. And I think it's going to just be <laughs> to continue to expand geographically throughout North America to, to meet our merchants needs here. We're, we're evaluating uh, early days, but what international expansion could potentially look like to support our merchants abroad. 
and just continuously developing our software and systems to better serve our merchants and their shoppers. So whether that's the delivery experience, the fulfillment experience, or anything in between. And then from an industry perspective, Joe, I think that there's going to be a couple of things that happen. Certainly, we're going to see new entrants that come in and, and try to kind of bite off part of the market. You know, we, we truly believe in a consolidation, not in the single point solutions where one same day delivery company might purchase another. We really think there's going to, there needs to be a unification across the various service lines from port to porch. So, you know, drayage, middle mile, warehousing, last mile, reverse logistics. I think more companies need to be able to rely on fewer partners. And what we're trying to build is what we think the future looks like. And we may be right, we may be wrong, we may be somewhere in between. But our opinion is that brands are just going to want uh, fewer but deeper relationships with, with partners that they can rely on. Yeah, well, that makes sense. And again, I think, I, I think the rapid growth and success you guys have had shows your models working right now. So whether it works in 10 years, who knows, but it works right now. So before we, before we have to end, who's your sweet spot? Who do you work with? Who's your kind of your best customers? So it's not going to be uh, industry specific, Joe, but it'll probably be something that's more like size specific because we've architected our operation to be size agnostic to the profile of product. So it can be a sock or it could be a three section, three seater sectional sofa or anything in between. So really it's um, a high growth brand or an enterprise brand that's at scale that needs to really deeply think um, how they can optimize their current supply chain. They might be doing the same thing for the past five to 10 years. They might want to like think about what are efficiencies and what are other opportunities that aren't being presented to me today that's our sweet spot. It's where we can like truly deeply partner on an operational and technological level and lean in uh, quite heavily. So that, that's the sweet spot for us. It, it, it reminds me, uh, I had an old boss who used to say, I want to work with right thinking guys. And what he meant by guys is who are aligned to us. And you said that who want to partner, who value partnership. And by the way, I say this all the time regarding anyone I've ever worked with, regardless of the business, anybody that holds you at arm's length, who doesn't want to have a meeting, doesn't want to have that quarterly business review. At some point, those don't work out in my mind. That It's just at some point you either both commit to that relationship and say it's going to take time and we're going to build it or bye-bye. <laughs> you, you got it. So we, we hope to continue to foster those positive relationships. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. So before you go, I was talking before we hit record, we were talking to Jessica and Beth from your marketing comms team. And they said, you guys will be at Home Delivery World and at Retail Delivery Connect and a whole bunch of other of the conferences. Yeah, you bet. If there's a, a relevant conference in fulfillment, last month delivery, et cetera, you can probably count on us being there and, uh, and seeing us in person. So uh, looking forward to that. Well, Mark, thank you so much. And congratulations on your success. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk about what you guys are doing. And I love the cross-border aspect of this. And I love that... Because I think this is this is one of the places where sustainability is going to stall when I have a fulfillment center 20 minutes from the uh, U.S. border or tw uh, or 20 minutes from the Canadian border, and I have to have two locations. We have to get to the place where we do that cross-border. And I think no one does cross-border better than U.S.-Mexico. I mean, U.S.-Canada. U.S.-Mexico, we've got the volume, but U.S.-Canada is the easiest. You got it. You got it. You know, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time and I appreciate all you taking the time to listen to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, Onward and Upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversation with experts in the logistics field. For more details, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com or follow Joe Lynch on LinkedIn. <laughs>